Now, according to this, um, if you go into Canvas now, this morning I still had unit D up at the top. Ignore my little thingies here. You should not see them on your end because I don't have them published. This is just me trying to prepare the other units ahead of time. Um, but the unit three should be up and posted for you to see inside Canvas already, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just click on the overview real quick so you can kind of get an idea of how fast you're gonna be moving in this particular unit. Um, I was looking at the sections this morning and I don't know that I'm gonna be able to get, I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to get to 3.3, much less be able to cover like half of it, okay? So if I have to modify this calendar, I will, right? Um, but I'm just gonna keep going through it until we get to all the stuff that we need, okay? But essentially we're covering 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, and then 4.1 and 4.2. So that's really five sections. Um, these two go hand in hand, okay? Cause this is all about the rational functions. So 4.1 is really short. There's not a lot of information. It is new information, right? And then 4.2 is really us just applying what we learned in 4.1. So that's why I have them grouped together because those two sections are small and I will be able to cover both of those in one day. What I'm concerned with is the 3.2 has got a bunch of definitions in it. And so it might take me a little while to get through 3.2 today, okay? Um, but I did push 3.3 into tomorrow. Um, and so hopefully we can make it there. If not, we might have to get rid of the homework day and you'll just have that weekend to get the homework done, okay? If need be, I'll just keep going through the class time and see how far we can get, okay? Um, the test will not be until Monday, November the 1st, okay? If I have to push that down to Tuesday because for some reason we didn't get to it and I need you guys to get in there and have the homework day, well then we'll talk about that then, okay? But for right now, this is kind of what the calendar looks like, okay? Um, Go back to the modules. So the homework assignments are already there. I am gonna have to change those deadlines because those are like the deadlines from the very, very beginning of the semester, okay? And we are obviously not gonna finish this by um, October 27th, okay? So I'm gonna have to push that out a little bit. I also am going to, as soon as I get back in my office, I'm going to open up all the old homework, okay? So if you're still trying to beef up your unit one and unit two scores for the college algebra class, you can still go back in there and uh, beef up some of those homework grades, okay? So today I will push those out and I'll probably push them out until Halloween because our test is supposed to be on the first, right? So I'll just push them until the Halloween. Once we take this unit three test, um, I don't know why this is unit D, but anyway, um, once we take that unit three test, then what we'll do is I'll push the homeworks again until the end of the unit four. I'm just gonna keep pushing them back. There will be a point in time where that's it, <laughs> but that's not until December, okay? Okay, let's see what we got here for this section. Come on computer. So again, I think I said it before I was recording, but um, once I finish grading the online, the people that took the test online, um, once I finish grading those tests, I'm gonna start creating those reports over the weekend, just like I did with the midterm reports, so that you can just see how this test score and these past homeworks affected everything. Okay, so we're finally in unit three. We only have three more units after this. It's unit three, unit four, and unit five. Then we're done for the semester, okay? So for this section, this unit, it's all gonna be about polynomials. Now, we have only learned how to graph um, quadratics. That's the only kind of polynomials that we know how to graph right now, okay? We know that those look like parabolas. We know how to find the vertex. We know whether it opens up or down, right? All that good stuff. Um, now we're gonna try to start extending our graphing skills to all polynomials, okay? That means it could be an X to the third, 
It could be an X to the fourth. It could be an X to the fifth. It could even be an X to the sixth, okay? It can go as high as it needs to. Normally, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of cubes, fourth powers, and fifth powers, okay? We don't, I don't think we do anything too, too high up there. Um, but just be aware that we are going to be graphing all kinds of polynomials. So in order for us to do that, of course, we have to go back to our transformation so we can learn how to take like an X cube function or an X to the fourth function and then shift it around and flip it upside down and all that good stuff that we were doing with the quadratics, right? Then we're gonna talk about um, leading coefficients, okay? So if they're not in the transformations format where you have something happening inside the power and then something happening outside the power, if it's just already all expanded, you actually have to use this test to figure out what it's gonna look like, okay? We're also gonna learn something about these zeros. Zeros are just x-intercepts, right? And so only the real zeros are the ones that we can graph. If we get imaginary stuff, we can't graph those, okay? So that's why this section is concentrated on just the real zeros, because that will help us graph. Um, and then one of the other things that we'll learn about is the intermediate value theorem. This also might help you locate polynomial functions. We might not use this a whole bunch in this class, but I think you do use it in pre-cal and in calculus. So you'll see that intermediate value theorem come back, okay? So at least if we just show it to you, then you will have seen it and hopefully it'll drop back thing later. So first we're gonna go into this. So it says, in this section, you'll study the basic features of graphs and polynomial functions. The first feature is that the graph of a polynomial function is continuous. What it means in layman's terms is that if you start tracing it from one arrow, right? And you trace the whole graph, as long as you never have to lift your pencil up ever, it's considered continuous, okay? When you get to calculus, there's a real actual mathematical definition for continuous, okay? But for right now, it's just very elementary. <laughs> Can you trace it without ever having to pick up your pencil? Now be careful because I have smart Alex, okay? <laughs> Always have smart Alex, okay? I have people that will do this. Let's just say the graph looks like this, okay? I'm just pretending that's my graph. I'll have someone go, well, I can draw this without having to pick up my pencil. I just do this, right? <laughs> this is continuous. This is not continuous. There's a hole there in the middle, isn't there? So technically when you're drawing it, you're supposed to literally go like this, stop, pick up your pen, come over here and draw the rest of it, right? Because this is just a visual representation of something missing, okay? There's not actually an open circle. If you were to graph it on a graphing calculator, there's nothing there. It literally just goes like this and there's like a gap like that, okay? We choose to put this there to symbolize the fact that there's a gap there or a hole there, okay? So be very careful. I always have somebody saying that, oh, I can draw it, it's continuous. No, no, it's not, okay? The easiest way I can explain to you right now without us having that calculus definition is that if it has any holes or any breaks in the graph, then it's not continuous. Okay, so this picture right here actually has both, doesn't it? Not only do we have a hole, but we also have this break in the graph. And it doesn't matter whether the break is in the Y values or if the break is in the X values, okay? So notice that this one doesn't have a gap going this way, it has a gap going that way, right? It doesn't matter. The fact that there's a, a gap or a break or the fact that there's a hole makes it not continuous. Okay, so this one says, um, is it a piecewise defined function that is not uh, continuous? Apparently they describe this with one function, they describe that with another function, and the fact that they don't connect is why it's not continuous, okay? So remember, holes and breaks or gaps. What tells us there, right? No breaks, no holes, and no gaps, and that's considered continuous, okay? Okay, so there might be some problems in your homework that just literally ask you, is this continuous? Yes or no? Okay, and so you're just looking for those holes, gaps, or breaks. If you see them, no. If you don't see any holes, gaps, or breaks, the answer is yes. Now, the second thing that we're gonna learn is what's called um, 
smooth. Okay, so it, it has only smooth, rounded turns. That's important because I can turn the function like this. Doesn't the absolute value turn? It changes from a negative slope to a positive slope, doesn't it? But notice that that turn right there is a sharp turn. Okay, it just goes down and then just straight up. Okay. On polynomials, you don't have sharp turns like that. Okay, you have curvy turns. Okay, so it's super important when you're drawing your polynomials. If I find out that there's a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point there, I am not going to be drawing my graph like that, right? Nope, you have to make them curvy. They're like little tiny parabolas all over the place. Okay, that's what you gotta think of, okay? So don't draw, it's just a matter, of <laughs> it's so silly, but I was trying to get my daughter to draw her Ws and it's a difference of drawing this W and I call the other one butt cheek, but <laughs> drawing that W, right? They're both Ws, but one of them is curvier than the other one, right? And so that's what you got to keep in mind. You need to keep it curvy when you connect all those little points together. Okay, that's it. It's not anything complicated too bad yet. Um, a big old paragraph for what? So a polynomial cannot have a sharp turn. We just talked about that. And it's just giving us an image of a graph that does have a sharp turn so that you can tell the difference between a sharp turn and a smooth rounded turn. Okay. So not too, too much so far, it's not that bad, but it's gonna be a bunch of little tidbits like that in this section, okay? So it says, using the features presented in this section, coupled with your knowledge of point plotting, intercepts, and symmetry, you should be able to make reasonably accurate sketches by hand. The polynomial functions that have the simplest graphs are monomials. So it's just X with some power, and that's it, okay? Not there's a difference between this as my function and then this, right? So they're saying these guys are way easier to graph than something that's all expanded out like that, okay? These you can graph using your transformation, right? We know that we can take this x and we can add or subtract a number on the inside and we can add or subtract a number on the outside, right? The ones on the inside will shift it left or right, and the numbers that are being added or subtracted on the outside can be used to shift the graph up or down, okay? We also already know that x cubed is one of our basic functions. We know that x cubed looks like this, right? We also know that x squared looks like this, this is basically the typical model for all x to the odd functions. And this is the typical model for all x to the even exponents, okay? The only thing that changes with these two as the exponents get bigger is that right around the x-intercept, it starts to look a little bit flatter, okay? And if I were to do an x to the fourth, and we've talked about this before, it starts to look a little bit flatter around that x-intercept, okay? And if I go even larger, then all that happens is that flat looking region lasts longer, right? Do you get the idea? I don't wanna draw any more of these things, <laughs> but it's just the flat part just starts looking more and more flat, right? It just widens out that flat looking part, okay. So we do know, have an idea of what the basics would look like, and it's just a matter of shifting them left or right or shifting them up or down, okay? And so this is literally saying the same exact thing I did with all of those images. It's showing in the gray area that that's x squared, okay? So see how x squared is pretty rounded right there at the x-intercept, right? But then when I got to a higher even power, it kind of stretched a little bit flatter at the bottom. And the same thing with the X cube. The X cube has like half of a parabola that way and half a parabola downward. And then as the exponent gets higher, odd, it just starts to look flatter, okay? So it's the same thing that I talked about. Um, and then this is just literally saying what I just said. <laughs> so the greater that that exponent gets, the flatter that the graph is gonna look next to that origin, okay? 
Why does it look weird? Okay, there we go. So for this, it says sketch the graph of each function. And so they have some basic transformations in there, right? What does the negative do to the graph? Mm -hmm. So I know that it's because this guy is odd, it's going to look like the X cubed. It's just going to be like a little bit flat on the end, right? Right there in the center. So it's a little bit flat in the center. That's what an X to the fifth looks like. But you're right, that negative is going to flip it over. It flips it over the X axis, right? The negative in the front. So that means that this top part is not going to go up anymore. It's actually going to go downward, right? And this bottom part is going to flip upward. So it's going to go this way, right? And that's exactly what they have here. But notice that it's a little flat around the center, right? Because it's not a regular x cube, it's an x to the fifth. Okay, it's got a higher exponent. But essentially, that's all they're doing. What's happening to this one? It's going to the left one unit. And it's not a square, it's a fourth power, right? So we will have the same flat looking thing, but what will happen? Will the ends do this on an X to the fourth? What will the ends do if it says X to the fourth? They'll both go up and there's no negative in the front. So it doesn't flip it over, right? A regular X squared should go up. The fourth power is just gonna make it look flat, okay? So it should go up and be flat in the center, but then it's gotta go and shift over to the left. So here's the image of what it looks like, right? It looks like a parabola going up, but it's a little bit flat right here around the center. And then instead of the center being at zero, it got pushed back over one unit, right? So you're just sketching these things, okay? We're not quote unquote graphing them just yet. We're just sketching those graphs, okay? What that? What does that mean? Because I'll get a lot of people, I'm saying, it's not telling you to graph it, it's just telling you to sketch it. Graphing it means that every single point on the image has to be where it's supposed to be. Every single little dot has to be where it's supposed to be, okay? A sketch is just, you know, these bits of information and you just kind of assume how it's gonna look in between, okay? And so there's a difference between having an actual graph and then having just a sketch. For us, we're gonna sketch them by hand and then we always have multiple choices on the computer and we have multiple choices on the test. You just find the one that looks like yours, okay? If there's two that are possible, but you're like, I don't know if it goes, no, let's just give me, let me give you an example. Let's say I know I have this x-intercept and this x-intercept and I know it's an x to the fourth, right? So I know that it's gonna go up like a parabola, right? But what I don't know is that as it go down just a little bit, does it go down a bunch, right? I don't know how far down that's gonna go, okay? And so that's what I mean by, you might have to do something later to distinguish between two choices, right? But we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, okay? But there may be, I you couldn't even see my graph, sorry. So <laughs> if I knew these X2 intercepts, I don't know if the curve goes just a little bit down like that under there, or if it deep, it dives all the way down and then comes back up. Okay, I wouldn't know that information unless I picked a number in the middle, plugged it in, and then I would know how far low it goes. Okay, so let's go ahead and see some more information because that's fantastic. We have just kind of roped in the higher powers with our transformations, right? So nothing new is just, you know your transformations, now you can extend those to fourth powers and fifth powers, right? Just make them flatter in the center. That's all that that first section is talking about, okay? Now what we're gonna be talking about is what happens when your polynomial does look like this, right? Remember I showed you those? You can't use transformations with these because it's not just the X cube by itself, okay? It's got all these terms. And so when you have an expanded polynomial like this, you can still tell what's gonna happen at the ends, 
okay? So we know that a quadratic goes up on this side and up on that side, right? We know that the cube goes up on this side, but then goes down on this side, right? Okay. We also know that negative x squared goes down on both sides because they flip over, right? We also know that negative x cubed will flip these over. So it'll go down on the right and then up on the left, okay? We can use the fact of what the ends are doing to be able to tell you what this is gonna do on the end. I have absolutely no idea what it's gonna do in the middle just yet, okay? So if I can figure out what's happening to this graph, fantastic, I know that it's gonna do this, but I don't know if it's gonna go like that in the middle. I don't know if it's just gonna go one little hump. I have no idea what's gonna happen in the middle, okay? All that this leading coefficient test is gonna tell me is what's gonna happen on the end, all the way far left and all the way far right, okay? We'll figure out what happens in the center as we keep going through the section, okay? Actually, through the whole chapter, we're gonna learn how to figure out what's happening in the middle, okay? But baby steps, let's just figure out what's happening on the ends first, right, okay? So the way it works is, is you take this long polynomial, and you only look at what's called the leading coefficient, okay? The leading coefficient is the guy with the highest power. So in this particular function, who would be the leading term? Mm -hmm. So the leading term is going to be x cubed, and then the leading coefficient of that term is what? Yes. There's a positive one in front of it, right? It's invisible, but it's there, right? So that's gonna tell me the leading coefficient. Now, this is where you figure out what's going on. If the exponent in the leading term is even, then it's going to look like this one, okay? If it's odd, it's gonna look like the cube. So you'll know what's gonna happen on the end. If it's positive, I mean, if it's even, or if it's odd. The leading coefficient though is gonna tell you whether it's gonna, the even power is gonna open up or whether the even power is gonna open down. Same for the odd power. That coefficient is gonna tell me whether it's going up to the right and down to the left or the reverse, okay? Since I have a cube and my leading coefficient is positive, my ends are gonna look like this one, right? I just don't know what's gonna happen in the middle, okay? I don't know where the x-intercepts are. I don't know where the y-intercept is. I don't know any of that information to be able to graph the in middle, okay? But I can tell you what's gonna happen on the end, okay? So I think they're going to give us all the little images. Yes, they do. What is it doing? Okay, I don't like the way they organize this, but whatever. It's the publisher is the one that put all these things together. I just kind of grab them and put them in here. So it says X moves without bound to the left or to the right of the graph of the polynomial function. And this is a basic expanded polynomial, right? I don't know what the highest power is, but they should be decreasing until they get to the constant, right? Mine did that, didn't it? I had X cubed, then I had two X squared, then minus X and plus five. Doesn't the powers go down, down, down until there's no X's? right? So if it's like this, you can pick out that leading coefficient. Even if it's not like that, you can still pick out the leading coefficient. What if my problem was like this? Right? You can still figure out who's the leading term. You just need to focus on who's got the higher exponent, okay? So this guy has the highest x, I should have had a square. This has the highest exponent, so this is still my leading term. And what is the leading coefficient? Still a positive one, right? It's just invisible, okay? Now, this is what I don't like, how they organize it. It should fit all together. When the n is odd, okay, it's either gonna look like this, like a basic cube. I just don't know how much wiggling is gonna happen in the center here. That's why they have dotted lines. 
I don't know what's going to happen there. Or if it has a negative leading coefficient, it looks like the reverse, right? So instead of going up on the right, it goes down on the right. And instead of going down on the left, it goes up on the left, right? It may not be centered at the origin like the basic X cubed. It could be shifted, right? We don't know where it's going to be at, okay? And then if it's even and the leading coefficient is positive, we know the, polynomial, the parabolas both go up. But if you have a negative coefficient, we know that the both of the ends are supposed to go down, okay? I like to summarize all of that stuff that we just saw. It's a lot of information like this. I say positive x to the even should look like this. And you will literally see these images in your choices, okay? If I have a negative x to the even, I know it's going to be something in the middle, and then it's going to go down, okay? If I have a positive x to the odd, we know that the cube goes up on the right and then down on the left. But if it's a negative x to the odd, then it's going to do the reverse. So it's going to go up on the left and then down on the right. That makes sense? This is what I remember. I don't remember all of that other stuff, okay? And that's all I need to know. And when I'm deciding which one of these it is, who am I supposed to be looking at? If I look at this big polynomial, who's the guy I'm supposed to be focused on to decide whether which of these four groups is it? The leading coefficient or the leading term. So in my case in part A, it's this guy. Isn't he the term with the highest exponent, right? And so which one of these does it fit? Top left, top right, bottom left, or bottom right? It is the bottom right. You've got a negative in the front and an odd exponent, right? So my end behavior for this one is going to be like that, okay? What about in this polynomial? Who should I be focused on? X to the fourth. He's the guy with the highest exponent there. And so then top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Top left, this one, yes. It's a positive coefficient with an even exponent. So it'll go both up. Who am I supposed to focus on on this one? Mm -hmm. This is the guy with the highest exponent, right? So we're gonna look at that one only. It's got a positive coefficient, invisible one, right? And what kind of exponent? Odd, so it's a positive odd, right? And so it's gonna have this end behavior, okay? But I'm literally just using this chart and making sure that I'm only focused on the guy with the highest exponent, okay? That is a question on the test. So that's a pretty easy one to take some points on on the test, okay? Unfortunately, it is one of those ones where you either get it right or get it wrong, right? There's not really much to do or show on those problems. Um, they graph the darn thing. We are not expected to graph it, but notice that it does have that same end behavior that we said it was gonna have, right? For the second one, the X to the fourth thing, we don't know what it was supposed to look like, but it does have the same end behavior that the other one had, okay? And then the last one as well, it has that same in behavior, okay? That's all we're focused on right now. We are not focused on what are the X values? What are the X intercepts? What's the Y intercept? And how do the curves look? Not yet, okay? It's gonna be a while before we get there. <laughs> I think not until we're done with 3.4, do we get there? Maybe even 3.5, we can actually graph the whole polynomial, okay? I think they'll start warming us up and letting us graph some stuff. Like, well, if you have these kind of things, you can graph it. But then as the polynomials get more complicated, we have to learn more tricks, okay? And so we'll learn more things to do. So it says, an example to all of these problems, it says, note that the leading coefficient test tells you only whether the graph eventually rises or falls to the right or the left. It doesn't tell you what's happening in the middle, okay? Other characteristics of the graph, such as the intercepts, the minimum and maximums, right? So how high does it go? How low does it go, right? Those are the mins and the maxes. Um, those have to be determined by other means. 
Okay, we don't know that just yet. So we're gonna get into those intercepts. We know how to find y-intercepts. Y-intercepts are never a problem, okay? You can always find a y-intercept by just plugging in zero, right? Whatever the polynomial looks like, you just make all the x's zero and that's your y-intercept, right? That's not complicated. What's going to be complicated is finding these zeros. What does this word mean? I've said it today, does anybody remember? Right, so this whole rest of the section and even the next section is gonna focus on how to find the x-intercepts, okay? Those are gonna be harder, especially because we, so far, only know how to factor quadratics and things that have four terms, but the only way we can uh, factor things with four terms right now is by grouping. What happens if I try to group it and the two parentheses don't match? Then I can't continue grouping, right? And you can't factor it, okay? So we have to learn some other ways to factor, other ways to be able to get the function in its factored form so that I can get the x-intercepts, okay? So we're gonna have to learn some things. But right now, they're just gonna focus on, this really has nothing to do with the zeros, but I guess it kind of does. So what they're saying is that it says, a polynomial function of any power, it doesn't matter what the power is, um, the following statements are true. The function has at most that many a number of real zeros. Notice that it says at most, okay? Which means if I have an x to the cube function, I keep just using the same function, okay? If I have an x cubed function, three is my highest power, right? That means I can have three x-intercepts that I can draw, or I could have two x-intercepts that I can draw, or I can have one x-intercept that I can draw, okay? And when we get later, 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 <laughs> later in the section, in this chapter, you'll actually realize that this can only either have three or one intercept that I can draw. And I'll explain it to you why right now, but we will see it later. Sometimes when you solve quadratic equations, you get two answers, right? Always you get two answers. But sometimes those two answers can be either a number that repeated itself twice, right? Or it could be two real numbers, or it could be two imaginary numbers, right? When you do that quadratic formula, isn't that the three possibilities? You can get one number, you can get two numbers that are good numbers, real numbers, and then you can get two that are imaginary. Imaginary numbers always come in two. Always, 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 okay? So if I can draw three of my x-intercepts, fantastic. All three of them are real. But if there's some x-intercepts that I can't draw, it's because they were imaginary. And I know for a fact that they come in pairs of two, right? So that means I'm either gonna have three x-intercepts that I can draw, or I'm only gonna have one x-intercept that I can draw, okay? We're gonna get into that a whole lot more later and they're even gonna make a chart and it's gonna tell you like all the possible things that can happen in this graph, okay? As we learn more information, you'll be able to decide which of those possibilities is actually yours, okay? But I just want you to keep that in mind that the imaginaries come in pairs, okay? So other than knowing how the maximum number of intercepts that I'll have, um, I also can tell you how many times the little graph is gonna turn over, right? How many times is it gonna do these little minimums and maximums? What I don't know yet is whether they are minimums or maximums, okay? That all depends on what the graph is doing. And once we get further, you'll be able to see this, okay? But I do know that whatever that power is, it is gonna have at most, again, this many turning points, okay? So for here, I know that my power is three. That means I could have at most three x-intercepts. And it also means that I could have at most two turning points. It doesn't mean I will have three x-intercepts or I will have two turning points. It just means that's the most I can have, okay? 
So when you're drawing your graph and you figure out, you know, oh, I know my end behavior needs to look like this. And you're like, oh, the graph needs to look like that. That's wrong. That's way too many turns, right? You've got one turn there, another turn here, third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, and a sixth one. This is supposed to have at most two, right? So you know you did too much wiggling here in the middle, okay? That's the whole point of knowing how many turning points you're gonna have. People will get like, oh, it has to be like this. It also helps you to lose, use logic. When you start graphing, you might be able to catch that you have an error in there because you're like, the points are showing me I'm gonna have three turns. But according to this rule, I'm only supposed to have two turns. So one of my points must be bad, okay? So it'll start to help you kind of like logically work through the problems. So what else do they have for me? It says there's a strong interplay between the graphical and the algebraic approaches to this problem. So it says when f is a polynomial function and a is a real number, the following statements are equivalent. A at x equal to a is a zero of the function. Okay, that means there's going to be an x intercept when x equals a. X equals A is a solution to the polynomial equation being set equal to zero. X minus A is a factor of the polynomial function. And then the point, whatever that value was, and zero is the X intercept of the graph. We already know this. We already know that when we set a function equal to zero, you have to factor it first. Once you set your factors equal to zero, right, you get your solutions. And then that's how you figure out what the x-intercepts are, okay? So we already know this information. They're just kind of spelling it out for you again, okay? You might actually get through this section. I thought it was going to be super, super long. It's okay. Not going to try to rush through it, so this one says, find all the real zeros, then determine the maximum possible number of turning points for the graph of the function. So remember, to find the zeros, you have to set the function equal to zero. So they're taking this part of the function and they're setting it equal to zero, right? And then you would try to solve this guy. So the front number is negative, so I have to factor out a negative. And then what do these two guys have in common? They have a two and an x squared, right? So when you factor out the negative two x squared, you actually end up with a positive x squared and then a minus one, right? Always double check your factoring. If I distribute those, if I distribute this negative two x squared, do I get those two terms? Then they factored it, good. Then they try to continue factoring because they notice there's a square right there, right? There's a power, you should be able to factor it. Well, not always, but. For now, yes. So here, they can factor that into the difference of squares, right? We know how to do all this. This is not new, okay? Then if I set this factor equal to zero, I get zero. If I set this factor equal to zero, I get positive one. And then if I set that factor equal to zero, I get negative one, right? Okay, so these are the real zeros. What was the power at the very beginning, the highest power? x to the fourth, but how many zeros did I get? I only got three, right? I actually got four. It's just this one happens twice. Notice the power here, okay? So this one actually appears twice. We will learn more about that relationship between the power and the zero that came out of that power in a little bit, okay? I think it's in the next section. It has a name and we'll talk about that later, okay? However, because the function is a fourth power, fourth degree, um, the graph can have at most four minus one turning points. So that would be the maximum of three turning points, okay? And then it says in this case, the graph has three turning points. And how do they know that? Let's look at this. Just based off of what we know so far, I can sketch the graph, okay? Here's where we're gonna go. What is the highest power? It's right here. I'm just going to look at this for a moment. What is the highest power there? X to the fourth. 
So if I look at negative 2x to the fourth, isn't that a negative coefficient with an even exponent? And according to the in behavior chart, it's supposed to go downward like that, right? And so I have these x-intercepts at 0, at 1, and then at negative 1. And from there, I know that the ends are going to go down and down, OK? I don't know exactly which way this is going to go, but I only have two options, OK? One option is, is that, no, I don't need, I have no options. This is going upward, isn't it? So it has to go up and then down and then up and then down. Actually, there are options, right? That's one option where it goes up first and then down, right? Here's another option. There's actually four options here. Let's say I go up, but instead of going down, I do this. Don't I still have two little turning points, right? Or what happens if this one doesn't go up? What happens if it goes down and then over here and then goes up? How many turning points are here? Two. This is a tricky question. I didn't ask it the last time. What if it goes down and then goes down again like this? How many turning points are there? It's not two. It's three. It's actually five. You're right. You have one turning point here, one turning point there, one turning point there, one there, and one there. There's five of them, right? Could that happen? It says I'm supposed to have at most three, right? So we know that that's not what's going to happen. Do you see what I mean? How you have to use your information you have and then a little bit of logic to figure out what the graph's going to look like, okay? So we also can make charts to help us out in that regard as well plugging in random x values to figure out what's actually going to happen. But let's go see what it looks like. I just wanted to talk. Oh, they don't even graph it for me. I guess we're not there yet. It says figure 312. Where's figure 312? I do not see no figure 312. Did they previously graph this for me? Oh, they did not. Nope, it's not graphed for me. But they're saying that it's going to have actually three turning points. Let's see what I know. I know it's going to go down. I know what has to do with those powers. So I'm just going to go through and then bounce and then go. How many turning points are there? Three. So that's what the graph looks like. Now, I don't know if it's like a short little hump or a long skinny hump, right? I don't know that yet. And we won't be able to know unless we make a chart and we say, oh, well, X between zero and negative one, I could try negative half. And between zero and positive one, I could try positive half. Once I know those Y values, I'll know how high up it goes, okay? And then be able to give you an actual graph. Now, and I'll also, we will get to it, how I knew that that's what it was going to look like, okay? If there is a way to look at the factored version and know that that's what it's going to look like, okay? I will show you when we get there. So it says, notice that in that example, um, the exponent is greater than one and it had this factor, which yielded a repeated x-intercept. I hate this word. It repeated x intercept at x equals zero. The fact that it repeated is how I knew that it did this. Okay. Instead of just like going through that zero. Okay. We'll talk more about that just right now, actually. Yay. So super soon. <laughs> so repeated zeros. When you have a factor and it could look like this, what does it look like if the number here is zero? If that number there is zero, wouldn't it just look like that or just like that, right? Isn't that exactly what we had right there, right? Okay, so these exponent is called multiplicity. 
told you I had a word, right? <laughs> that word is multiplicity, okay? So I can get the quote unquote zero, the x-intercept, I'm taking this factor equal to zero. And I get where the x-intercept is, but this power tells me the multiplicity of that x-intercept. It tells me how many times that x-intercept is going to repeat, okay? And depending on how many times it repeats, it will affect what the graph is gonna look like right there, okay? So it says when that exponent there, that multiplicity is odd, then the graph is gonna cross, okay, through the x, the x intercept. So it would be this situation. It would go right through it. If that multiplicity is even, then it doesn't cross through it, it just touches. I like to use the word bounce, but touches or bounces off that x intercept. And so that's how I knew it was gonna do this. Doesn't it just like touch it and then bounce right back off, right? That's what happens when the exponent is even. What you can do to remember which one does what is think of your basic functions. If you have an x to the odd function, isn't that a cube, right? And cubes, they don't go in this direction. They can, right, if there's a negative in front, but don't they go right through the x-intercept in the middle? And when you think of functions that have even powers, what do those do? Those, the, the x squared does this little thing right there at the x-intercept, doesn't it? And if it were a negative x-intercept, it would go downward, right? And the same thing with the cube. If it were negative, it would go this way. So that's all that this is saying. When those little exponents are odd, it's gonna cross, when they're even, they're gonna to touch. So let's go back to this problem. What is the exponent out here? One, what is the exponent out here? One, this one has an even multiplicity, this one has an odd multiplicity, and this one has an odd multiplicity, right? So what that means is I'm gonna cross through these two guys because this came from this factor, which is odd, this guy came from the middle factor, which had an odd multiplicity, but zero came from that factor, which has a even multiplicity, right? So this one is actually just gonna bounce. Now, I only knew this. This is all I knew, right, from the end behavior. Then it's telling me at negative one, I have to cross. That means I cannot go downward because that would be a bouncing, wouldn't it? I would have to go through that x-intercept so I know what's happening there. I don't know how high I'm going, but I do have to at some point come back to this x-intercept, don't I? So I am gonna have to turn to go back toward that x-intercept. But at this x-intercept, which is zero, it's supposed to bounce, right? So then I know that I can't go through it. I have to actually just bounce right off of it, okay? And so I'm going up again, aren't I? but I still have to get to this x-intercept, which is supposed to cross. So at some point I do have to turn. I just don't know how high up or how low I'm gonna turn. And then I can go right back through there. And I am supposed to go through there because it does say it's gonna cross through it, right? So then that's how I knew what it was supposed to look like, just based off of the multiplicity. Only thing I'm missing to get the actual graph is to know how high up these things go. And like I mentioned, you can figure that out just by creating a chart, okay? So you might actually start being able to get into some stuff, like actually graphing. Um, a polynomial function is in what they call standard form when the terms are in descending order, right? My function that I keep repeating is in descending order, right? The powers go down, down, so there's no x's, okay? It says, before applying the leading coefficient test to the polynomial, it is a good idea to check that the polynomial function is in standard form. Also, when we factor, it's super helpful to have it in that form, right? So essentially, if it's not in descending order, put it in descending order, okay? I want to see what the factor value is. Okay, so good, I got one to graph there. And then another one with some information. And then some more information. 
Okay, nothing with the intermediate value theorem, but we're gonna talk about it. Again, this is one of those things that I just have to check the box that I told you. <laughs> you might not see too many problems that have to do with this, but I have to talk about it, okay? Because the calculus people are gonna expect that you've seen it at least, okay? So the intermediate value theorem says that if you have two points, some x value and its corresponding y value, another x value and its corresponding y value. If there are two points on the graph of a polynomial and those two y values are not equivalent to one another, if they're not equivalent, then that means one has to be a little bit higher or lower than the other, right? So they either need to be, you know, one is a little bit higher like that or one is a little bit lower, right? So you have no choice. If they're not equivalent, then the y values are gonna be off. They're not gonna be together on the same, the same y value, okay? What that means is that, is that there is a number in the middle of these two y values, right? So there's a number in the middle of those two y values they're calling b, okay? Um, and there must be a number c between a and b. So let's say, for instance, that first point was the y value of A. There's the x value. There's the y value. Here's B. That's the x value for B. That's the y value for B. And then in the middle somewhere between these two, notice that this point in the middle has a y value between these two guys. And notice that that point also has an x value between these two x values, okay? Um, such that the that the y value of this c, of this x value, is actually going to equal d. Okay. The reason why they're mentioning this, this is the case no matter where this is positioned. Okay. However, if I talk about what's happening real close to here, if I get, let's say I have a and let's say I have b, pick, it doesn't matter. Do you want A to have a positive Y value or a negative Y value? Positive. So it's going to be up here. The other one has to be different. So this guy's Y value has to be negative. How am I going to connect these two? Aren't I going to have to cross through the X axis? I have to in order to connect them. So that means that there's an X intercept in between somewhere. Okay. And what is the Y value of that X intercept? zero. So we're going to now talk about what happens when this y value is zero. Okay. It's basically a way you can figure out what your x-intercepts are, or at least guess where your x-intercepts are. So it says, let the x values a and b be real numbers, of course, so that a is less than b. All that means is that a is on the left and b is on the right in your graph. Okay. That's what that means. If f is a polynomial function such that the y value for a is not the same as the y value for b, then in the interval a, b, somewhere in this little section, um, f takes on every value between f of a and f of b. Isn't that true in between here? Don't I have a point for this x value? I have a point for that x value, I have a point for this x value, so on and so forth, right? That's all that that sentence is saying. It says the intermediate value theorem helps you locate the real zeros or x-intercepts of a polynomial function in the following way. If you can find a value x, which equals to some number for which the polynomial function is positive, right? The y value is positive and another x value for which the y value is negative. Then you can conclude that the function has at least one real zero in between these two values. Why does it say at least one? You told me A was positive and you told me B was negative, right? It could happen that I do this, right? And now I have more than one exponent in there, okay? So it could just be one straightforward or it could be multiple x intercepts in the middle, okay? <laughs> well, all I know is that there is one for sure. So this example says, here's my function, and here's the two x values that they gave me. Notice that if you plug in negative two in here, you get 
what? Negative three is your y value. And when you plug negative one into here and here, you actually end up with positive one is your y value. So here's my x value, here's the other x value. There's the y value, negative three, and here's this guy's y value of positive one. This guy has to connect. Now, whether it does a bunch of little turns in there or not, I don't know, but it does have to connect. And it says that the intermediate value theorem tells me I must have an x-intercept somewhere between those two numbers, at least one, okay? And it says, by continuing this line of reasoning, you can approximate any real zeros of a polynomial function to any desired accuracy. This concept is um, further demonstrated in example six. Do we do this? We don't call it example six, we call it example four. I think I removed some stuff from this section that was not, we're not gonna cover. So it says, use the intermediate value theorem to approximate that zero. So I already know that at negative, the other function had a plus here, this one has a minus here, okay? So notice that when I computed a few X values, when I plug these numbers in, they made a chart and they get these Y values out, okay? Notice right here is where something's happening, right? because you have a Y value that is negative, and then now you have a Y value that is positive. So at somewhere in between these two guys, we should have a Y value that is zero, right? So they start picking random numbers. They start picking between negative one and zero. They start picking numbers real close to negative one, okay? So they picked um, negative 0 0.8 and negative 0 0.7. And they notice that when they plug negative 0 0.8 into that function, they got a negative value. And when they plugged negative 0 0.7 into the function, they got a positive value. So now you've narrowed that margin further, right? Here we had zero and here we had negative one. It's not there. What was it, one? So zero and one is here, negative one, and negative one is there, okay? This is negative one, that's zero. Now they found these guys. So at negative 0.8, they're getting a negative number, and at negative 0.7, they're getting a positive number. So now I know there's something in between negative 0.8 and negative 0.7 where that x-intercept happened. So they say, well, then you obviously have an x-intercept in between there. You can keep continuing this process until you figure out exactly where it is, okay? Or you'll get super, super close, okay? When you start picking in, between there would be what? Negative 0 0.75 and negative 0 0.76, right? Are both of those in between here? Kind of in the middle, right? If I plug this in and I get a positive, or actually a negative, and then plug this guy in and get a positive, now you know that they're in between there, right? What happens if I plug it in and I get zero? Then I know that's where the x-intercept is, right? Okay, but you can keep going through that process. Once I know this, I can try 0 0.755 and 0 0.756, right? And keep going until I get real, real, real close to zero. I can't draw things that are that small anyway. If I have this as my graph, how in the world am I going to be able to tell if it's negative 7.55 or negative 7.56, right? You have to have like an idea of where it is, okay? So that's why they stopped at that. But like the paragraph said, you can keep going to get more accurate. When you get to calculus, you will keep going, okay? Now, let's see what does this say. It says for more accurate approximation, you could keep going, continuing the process until you get super, super close to zero, okay? That means when you plug in whatever X value, right? You're gonna get like 0, 0, 0.0000, something like that. And then when you plug in the other X value, you get positive 0, 0.00. You're getting real close to that central point, right? So finally we get to practice problems and they want us to graph this. So 
the only thing we know so far, this is it. We can tell you what the end behavior is gonna look like. So that's one thing I know how to do. We can tell you how many turning points there is going to be. We could tell you what the y-intercept is. That one's super easy. We can even tell you what the x-intercepts are. Okay. After that, you're just guessing. Okay, you're just trying to figure out what's going on here. And I'm gonna be more specific here. Intercepts with multiplicity. Because I need to know that multiplicity information in order to tell you if it's gonna go through that spot or just kind of touch it and go back the way it came. I have to know these four pieces of information. So is this guy in descending order? Because I definitely need that for these first and last parts. It has to be in the right order. This guy good? Yeah, right? Five, three, one, and that's just all it has, right? So which one of these terms is the one I'm gonna look at to decide the end behavior? This term right here, it's got the highest exponent, right? What kind of coefficient does it have? A positive or a negative coefficient? A positive, it's a fraction, but I don't care about that, right? I just care about the sign. Now, what kind of exponent does it have? An even or an odd? It has an odd. And according to that chart over there, this is like a positive x cubed. And so I know it's gonna look like this on the end, right? Still looking at that guy, what is the maximum number of turning points that I can have? Four, you take away one, right? So it could have four turning points max. It could have less than that, but no more than four, okay? And I won't know how many I have until I finish the rest of the process. The y-intercept, how do you find the y-intercept? That one's super easy. Plug in zero. So you're basically just finding f of zero. In this case, what happens if I plug in zero? I'm just gonna be adding a bunch of zeros, right? And so I just get zero. What does that tell me? That tells me that my y-intercept is at zero for x, because that's what I plugged in. And what did I get? I got zero for y when I was done. So that's gonna be my y-intercept at the origin. This is the hard part, the x-intercepts. The one that, the part that's gonna take the longest, okay? In order for me to find those x-intercepts, I have to take this function and equal it to zero. So let's factor. Do all of these terms have in common, something in common? What do they have in common? An x. And I'm gonna let you know now that if you have fractions, you need to factor out that fraction. So what is the common denominator here? Five. So I'm gonna have to factor out a one fifth. I do not want fractions in there because when I try to factor the fractions, it's gonna be a nightmare, right? So let's see, one fifth X times what will give me one fifth X to the fifth. I don't need a number, right? Because I already got the number I, I'm supposed to have, okay? But how many X's will I need? Four, then the minus sign. Now I have no idea about this, okay? So what I'm gonna do in my calculator is two divided by one fifth, and I get 10. So the number here I'm guessing is 10, and then I would only need two x's. Double check it, right? Does this times this give you negative two x cubed? This times this, does that give you negative two x cubed? It does, so we did factor it correctly. Again, I have another kind of sort of nightmare, but I can tell what happens if I take the fifth out. I'm just gonna have a nine, aren't I? And I took out an X, so that should be it. Double check it again. Make sure that when you multiply these two, you get the nine fifths X. Nine times one fifth. Put it in a weird form. It is nine fifths. This is not my calculator, so I'm just trying to 
to zero. Okay, now I should be able to factor this. This is what they call a quadratic type. So I should be able to factor it just like I would a quadratic, except what times what gives me x to the fourth? It's not x and x, x squared and x squared. Those together will give me x to the fourth, right? And then for nine, I have two options. I have one and nine or three and three. Which ones are gonna add to give me 10? The one and nine or the three and three? Mm -hmm. That's the only pairs I have, right? We have to get the one that's gonna add to give us 10. So we're gonna use the one and the nine and what do the signs need to be in order to get a positive nine, but a negative 10 when I combine? Positive when I multiply means they either both have to be positive or they both have to be negative, right? This guy always tells you this is the sign of the bigger number. And if that one's negative, how am I gonna get a positive nine? Only if this one's negative also, right? But now I have two difference of squares. So this one is gonna break up into x minus one and x plus one. And this factor is gonna break up into what? Mm -hmm. X plus three and x minus three. Again, it doesn't matter what order you put them in, it does not matter, okay? Notice we put the plus first and the minus here, right? It doesn't matter. So as long as you got one with the plus and one with the minus. Now, here are the zeros or x-intercepts. When I take this factor, we don't care about this coefficient part, okay? That's not necessary. When I take this factor equal to zero, what do I get? Zero. What is that factor's multiplicity? What is the exponent there for that one factor. It's one. And we'll put a semicolon. What zero do I get when I set this factor equal to zero? Positive one. What is the multiplicity for that positive one? Multiply. I didn't spell this one right the first time. I'm just going to put multiplicity. You can't fit it in there. Sometimes I just write m. What is this multiplicity? One. What about the next factor? What x-intercept do I get? Negative one, and I'm gonna put m equal to what? What is the exponent there? It's the little one up here. So there's a one up here, a one up here, a one up there, a one up there, and a one up there. So they're all gonna have multiplicity one. What is the zero I get here for this one? Mm -hmm. But that power is still positive one, right? What about for the last vector? Positive three, but again, that exponent is still one. So what does that mean? That means the graph turns, a graph crosses through zero, one, negative one, three, and negative three. On all of them, it crosses, right? Sometimes that doesn't happen, right? Sometimes it might actually bounce off of a few, but for this particular problem, it's gonna cross through all of them, okay? So let's put the information together that we have so far. Let me see, one, two, three, one, two, three. So I have an x-intercept at negative three, a positive three, a negative, oops, that's two, isn't it? At negative one, at positive one, and then at zero. And the y-intercept from way up here, it's already there, right? Isn't that the same spot? Okay. Otherwise, I'd have that one too. I also know my end behavior. 
My end behavior says it's supposed to go up on the far right and then down on the far left, okay? So that means here it's gonna go up and here it's gonna go down. Now I might not have angled those correctly, but I won't know until I figure out what's happening in the middle, okay? If I have to erase and angle it correctly later, I will. Now, I have to go negative three. I gotta cross through all of them, don't I? So that means I gotta cross through here. And at some point I need to come back down and cross through there. At some point I have to go back up and cross through there. Again, I don't know how high or how low these pumps are supposed to be. I'm just guessing, okay? That's all that's important. I promise you most of the time when you go look at your choices, there's only gonna be one that's doing the up and downs like you're doing, okay? If there happens to be two of them that are doing the ups and downs exactly like you, one of them might have a higher hump and one of them might have a lower hump and then you only just need to verify that one spot, okay? So let's say one of my graphs had this kind of hump and the other graph had that kind of hump. I would go plug in negative two into my function and see what y value I get. If I get a high y value, I know it's the one with the big hump, right? If I get a low y value, then I know it's the graph with the small hump. Does that make sense? Okay. How many turning points do I have in this image? Mm -hmm. You've got one there, one there, one there, and one there. And I am supposed to have four maps, right? So this doesn't violate anything, any of the information that I've received so far. Okay. So that's the graph. They're mostly like this. The only time, the only thing that's going to get more complicated, this is it. This is the whole process. Okay. The only thing that's going to get more complicated is sometimes you're not going to be able to factor this. You're just not, but you're still going to be expected to. Okay. And so, so far, we only have certain kind of techniques under our belt, right? We only know so much. We know how to factor and that's it. Eventually, I need to get you to expand. <laughs> we also don't know how to factor when there's fractions involved either, right? For me to keep myself safe, I had to factor out that fraction just so that I could have something that didn't have fractions in it anymore. Once we get through the next section, doesn't matter if there's fractions, positives, negatives, how many terms you have, you will be able to factor everything, everything, even if it has imaginaries, okay? So that's the only thing that's gonna change here is that it could possibly be a polynomial that I can't factor right now. We're gonna learn how to do that. So let's see what number two looks like. Number two is a little bit different. This one is exactly what you're gonna see on the test. And I'm sure there's gonna be a few of these in the homework. They're super quick, they're super easy. This one is literally just this part by itself. One part of the whole process all alone, right? It says, describe the left-hand and right-hand behavior of the graph of the polynomial. If you do not see those little images that I showed you earlier, um, all you see is words. I'm going to show you how to write those words. Okay. But I like to draw, I like to distinguish which little image first, and then I'll write it in words. Okay. So looking at this function, who should I be focused on to decide which way the ends are going to look? Right. This is the guy with the highest exponent, right? And so I'm supposed to look at him and what kind of coefficient does he have? A negative and what kind of exponent, even or odd? Odd. So I know by that little chart that it's supposed to actually go like this, okay? But in the web assign, it doesn't have that image, okay? The exam is given by the department. I did not create it. Um, it's just everybody has to take the same final exam for all college algebra classes. So there's a group of faculty that put that test together. They do use these images, okay? <laughs> so you will see this picture on the final, okay? Easy points there. You get this one right. <laughs> Easy points. On the web assign, it's not the same as us, right? Um, so on web assign, it doesn't have the pictures. What they say is what is happening on the left side? 
isn't it going up on the left side, right? So this is the left side and it's going up. So you say rises on the left. And on the right side, it's going down, isn't it? So you say falls on the right. And that's the way they're gonna write it. They're gonna say rises and falls, okay? Now, knowing that terminology that they're using, what is this one doing? What is it doing on the left? Rising or falling? It's rising on the left, and what is it doing on the right? Rising. So this kind rises on both sides, doesn't it? What does this one do? It falls on the left and the right. What is this one doing? Falls on the left and then rises on the right. Make sure you select the correct one because there will be two options. One that says rises and falls. The other one will say rises and falls. But the right and the left might be different. Okay. So make sure you're picking the one that says falls to the left and rises to the right. This one's backwards, right? It rises on the left and falls on the right. Okay. So just be careful with that terminology on the website. But that's it. That's it for that problem. We don't have to do anything else with it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this one says we have to do three things. One of them is find all the real zeros of the polynomial. Then two, determine whether the multiplicity of each zero is even or odd. Okay. Because that'll tell us whether we're going to cross or do bounds, right? And then determine the maximum possible number of turning points. So it's a lot like the first problem. It's just they're asking only these three pieces. Okay. So for A, it says find all the real zeros. The only way for me to find the zeros is to make the function equal to zero. Now, in order for me to do that, I have to factor it. Now it's already got the t squared factored, so I would have to factor this, okay? I mean, I could try to factor it. I could factor this using the EC method or just factor it because I know how to factor it, but if you don't want to factor it, or you're just like, nope, it's not today, I'm not gonna, waste my brain power thinking about this too long, right? What's the other way you can solve this? I'm gonna get another piece of paper because I need it. <laughs> it's not gonna fit all here. I could just take this and set this factor equal to zero and set this factor equal to zero. Right? Isn't that what I'm gonna have to do eventually? Regardless if it's factored or not, I'm gonna have to set each part equal to zero. This one's easy to solve. You just get t equal to zero, okay? So I have my zeros and I have the number zero. And what is its multiplicity? It came from this guy, right? What is his power? Two, so this is a multiplicity of two, right? And that's an even. So it's gonna have an even multiplicity. It's what it wanted. It wanted to know whether it was gonna be even or odd and that's it. This one, though, I have to factor it. Now, if you can factor, fantastic factor. But if you can't, you can use your quadratic formula. Um, negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. I get 10 plus or minus. And then what do I get on the inside of this little thing? 100 minus something or another, right? Let's see, um, four times three times seven. I get 84, so 100 minus 84 is 16. Two times three is six. So I get 10 plus or minus, what's the square root of 16? Four, so 10 plus four is 14 and 10 minus four is six. So I get seven over three reduced and one, right? Those are my two values. 
Now, how can I use these two values to write this in its factored form? Because that's going to be important later, okay? Especially when these polynomials get super big, okay? Remember, what this means is, if you go back here, it means that t equals 7 thirds and t equals 1. How do I get the factor out of that? Remember what the factors come from. They come from setting something equal to 0, right? So get 0 over here. How am I going to get 0 over here? What should I do to get this guy to be a zero? Minus one on both sides, right? So I get T minus one equal to zero. This is the factor, okay? So I know that that's one of the factors. What about this one? This one's a little bit more complicated. You actually have to get rid of the fraction first. We learned that in our fraction section. You must get rid of the fractions. So we have three T equal to seven, but I want a zero. So I'm going to minus seven. So I get that zero, but now I have three T minus seven, don't I? That's the other factor, three T minus seven, okay? So if I was looking at that function from the very beginning, it was like this, wasn't it? Wasn't it like that when I said it equal to zero? And using that quadratic formula, we cheated. <laughs> And we figured out how to factor the other parts. We get 3t minus 7 and t minus 1. Now, I could have done the AC method and got those same two factors. I could have, but some people just don't like the AC method. It just takes forever. And especially if the numbers are real big, doing the AC method will take forever. Okay, it just will. So at least you have another way of finding those factors. Okay, you just have to remember to get them equal to zero, okay? I'll show you the shortcut. The shortcut is, if I know what the answers are gonna be, I know that these are the answers, it's going to be T and then the opposite sign of these. So it should be T minus this guy and T minus that guy, right? But instead of having a denominator, you put that denominator as a coefficient of the T. So this one will look like t minus seven, and instead of the three down here at the bottom, it goes over here, okay? That's the fast way to do it. And then this one doesn't have a fraction, so it's just t minus one, okay? But that's the fast way you can get those factors. Once you know those, um, those values from the quadratic formula, I just had to show you why they are what they are, okay? Okay, now that I have it factored, it's real easy. If I set this guy equal to zero, you get zero with the multiplicity of two. If I set this one equal to zero, you're gonna get positive seven thirds with multiplicity of what? One, there's an invisible one here and here. This is this guy's multiplicity. If I set this guy equal to zero, I get positive one with multiplicity of what? the red one, right? So I'm gonna go back to my paper. I'll put this in the, in the group whenever I scan it. <clears throat> but for here, we're gonna say that our zeros are zero with even multiplicity and then seven thirds with what kind of multiplicity? Is the multiplicity even or odd? It's odd, it's just a one, right? And then the last guy would be, it's not seven, I think it's seven, it should be one. It'll be one with, again, odd multiplicity. That's important, right? Because I know that this one, I'm only gonna bounce from it, and these two, I'm gonna cross them, okay? I think that's all they wanted though. Find the zeros, we found it. Determine the multiplicity of each zero. I did that. And then now the last part says, determine the maximum possible number of turning points. You go back to this, or sky. The highest exponent is a three. So how many turning points? Only two. So 
the max turning points. is three minus one, which is two, okay? And so we have answered all of their questions. This is part A and B together, and then this is part C, okay? So A asked us just to find the zeros, we found them. And then part B said to determine whether the multiplicities of each were odd or even. And then part C just said find the maximum turning points, okay? Let's see what the last section is going to have for us for the last problem. Oh, this one's interesting. I just want to see if I was doing on time. I'm going to bring my watch to me. So this one's a little bit backwards. This one says, find a polynomial with the least degree possible and with coefficient of one and the given zeros, okay? I'm gonna tell you right now, your polynomial, when it's all factored, is gonna be x minus a with some exponent there. I like to use m, not k. I know they used k earlier, but I like m for multiplicity. x minus b and his multiplicity. x minus c and his multiplicity. And it just keeps going and depending on how many x-intercepts I have, okay? Now, normally they'll tell you the multiplicity. If they don't, you assume that it's just one, okay? So it might say four with multiplicity of two. Then you know that the four has a multiplicity of two. But if you don't see those words, assume that the multiplicity is one, okay? So for us right now, we have zeros. And I should actually put something here. You do have a coefficient. I know I'm using little a here and little a there, so I'm trying to distinguish the two things, right? This is an x-intercept, so are these guys. That is a coefficient, okay? It tells me what the coefficient is supposed to be, doesn't it? Okay, so I know that my function is going to have a one coefficient. Now let's talk about that first zero. It should be x minus that zero, right? X intercept. And what is the multiplicity if they don't tell me? One. Then I go to the next one. This should be x minus whatever this number is, which is one. And there's no multiplicity given, so it's one. X minus oops, a four. And again, nothing about the multiplicity. So it's a one, but it does want me, look at your answers in the computer. I don't need to write this one, do I? And how can I write that a lot nicer looking? It's just X, right? X with a one exponent, I don't need to write an exponent. This one, just a tiny bit simpler, looks like this. And this one, a tiny bit simpler, looks like that. If this is what you have in your choices, then you're done. You have met all the criteria and that's your function. If you look in your choices and they show x to the third plus five x squared minus two x plus a constant, right? Then you can't stop here. You have to multiply it out. You have to, okay? So I would first distribute my x, right? then that result still has to get multiplied by the x minus four, okay? And so then I would FOIL that out. And I get positive four x, and then combine my like terms. And this is the answer as well. It's just that one's the expanded version, right? So pay special attention on whether or not they want you to just write them as the factors or they want you to expand it out, okay? Now, I don't think, I don't think we're gonna have time to go into 3.3, but let's go look at what's inside WebAssign just to see if there's anything really different. Three point three is new, but it might not be that. It might not take us that long on Monday. Hmm. 
Mm, the graph of a polynomial is when it has no breaks or holes or graphs or gaps that would be continuous. Then number two, the blank is used to determine the left. Which one of these tests is used to determine the end behavior? The coefficient, the leading coefficient test. And then a polynomial function of degree n, meaning the highest power is n, has at most n real zeros and at most n minus one turning points. Um, X is, oh, those are those three statements. Okay, so this one is a solution to the equation here. Um, this guy is a factor of a polynomial. Didn't I do X minus on the last problem I just did? For all of them, X minus, X minus, X minus, right? And then this point is actually the X intercept. So once I solve all those little baby for, uh, factor equations, I get the x-intercepts. Let's see, number five says one is zero. Here has an even multiplicity. It should bounce, which they call touch. It just touches it and it comes back down. Or from the top, it touches it and goes back up. But when it's odd, it crosses. And then yields a repeated zero of multiplicity. So how many times does it repeat? That's what the exponent tells you. And then a polynomial is written in standard form when it's in descending order. So now we have a name for descending order. It's called standard form. And what else? Blank states that if a polynomial function has unequal y values, then f takes on every, which of, we didn't even talk about that, right? So <laughs> it's gotta be the intermediate value. Okay, let's go look at this. I can tell you right now, which one of these, there's two of them that have the correct end behavior and two of them that don't. What should the end behavior look like? x squared, so they're either going to be both up or both down. Which one? Both down. Why are both of them going to be down? Because of a little negative, okay? So already I know that, um, actually, yeah, these two are bad. Or, no, those two are good. Those both go down, right? These two are bad. They're both going up. So already I already chopped it down to just two. It's got to be one of these two. How many turning points can this thing have? Only one turning point. So is this possible? No, it has to be that one. Okay. Same thing here. What kind of behavior is the ends going to have? It's a force, so they're either both up or both down, but because it's negative, they're both down. So that chops me up into these two, right? But it has how many turning points? Maximum three. So I still don't know whether this one or this one is it. Okay. So for this problem, you actually will have to factor it so you can find out what the x-intercepts are, okay? If you find out that you get the x-intercept of zero and then some fraction here and some fraction there, then that's your graph. If you find out that the x-intercepts are zero and just one other fraction, then you get this graph, okay? So you do have to actually find the x-intercepts here. Factor that puppy out. I already gave you an example of how to factor out a fraction. Okay. In this problem, you actually have to factor out a negative fraction. Right? So be careful there. Okay. Let's see which one of these, it's an x to the fourth, but positive, right? So we should both be going up. So I'm down to these two. And I can have three turning points, which this one has one and two turning points. That's not really, that's like two, it's not considered a turning point. It's called a wiggle. <laughs> Literally, it's called a wiggle. Okay. And they know we haven't talked about it yet, but wiggles happen when the multiplicity is three. Okay. So it does go through it, doesn't it cross it? It just doesn't cross straight. It does like a little wiggle through it. Okay. We'll talk more about those though. 
So there's really only one x-intercept there and then one x-intercept here, okay? And over here on this graph, you have two x-intercepts, right? So in order for you to distinguish which one of these two is the answer, all you need to know is if that other x-intercept is a negative or if the other x-intercept is a positive. I can tell you just by looking at that. What's it gonna be? You can factor out the x cubed and you'll get the zero x-intercept, right? But you're gonna be left with an x plus two, aren't you? And what happens when you set the x plus two equal to zero? You get a negative two, don't you? So this one is the one that has to be it, okay? It's not gonna be a positive two. So it's that one, okay? But again, you should be factoring it and finding those x-intercepts. We did this problem. I don't know why it's the same, but it's, you might have different numbers. Notice how these numbers might be different, right? So you might get different numbers. You have a real good example of that one. And then these, what is this one gonna do? It's a positive and an odd. So positive on the odd. I know we're not, you can't see me in the video, but I'm gonna write it over. If it's a positive and an odd, it's supposed to do this. So which one of those options fits that, that image? Does it, does it rise to the right? It does. Does it rise to the left? No. Does it fall to the left? Yes. So it's this one. Okay, looking at this guy, because he's the guy with the highest power. It's a positive, what? Positive even or positive odd? Positive even. I'm gonna go over here. Positive even means it's going rising and rising, right? They're both rising. So let's do rise and rise. Then here, who am I supposed to be looking at? Because this is not in the right order. Almost negative four x squared. That guy is who I'm supposed to look at. So that one actually falls and falls when you have a negative and an even. This one, same thing. They're going to fall and fall. Those are really, really nice. You just need those little four tidbits and you're good. You could do those problems. These are a little bit longer, but there's nothing we haven't done. Just factor this, tell me the polynomials, tell me the multiplicity of those two polynomials. You're gonna get negative nine and nine for this problem. And since it's just one bubble with nine and one bubble with negative nine, both of their multiplicities are gonna, are gonna be one. <laughs> it's a power of two, so at maximum I have one turning point. So it cannot be these two, right? Those we'll have more than one turning point. It has to be one of those two. But it is positive x squared, so it must be this one. I'm going to go through all of them and do that, but <laughs> get the idea for all of those guys. Um, but lots and lots of practice. Here we go. This one. It does not tell me what the coefficient needs to be, so don't even put one. What happens when I do x minus zero? What do I get? I just get x. What happens when I do x minus a negative two? I get x plus two. What happens when I do x minus a negative five? X plus five. And it did not say that I had to expand it out, so I'm done. <laughs> if I hit check and it tells me x, then most expand it out, okay? This one, same thing, x minus zero is just an x. And then I have x minus one. And then I have x minus three, right? Those are not too bad. This is ugly, but whatever. It's x and I have to subtract both of these terms. What happens when you subtract more than one term? Don't they change signs? And then get out and then do x minus, and the one will become negative, and that square root of two will become positive. 
So notice what happened. When I put them in the parentheses, don't these guys change signs when I stick them in the parentheses? And just because it's two terms, it doesn't change that fact. Both of them need to change signs. Okay, so same here. Both of them need to change signs. Now, this one's a little bit different. It's polynomial. So when I do this, it's going to be x. What's minus a negative 2? Plus 2. But notice that it tells me that the degree is 2. How in the world am I going to get a power 2 if that's the only 0 or x-intercept I have? How would I get a polynomial with the power 2? And that's the only x-intercept that I can have. I have to have that. Because once I expand that, well, when I get a square, right, I will get a degree of 2. But I still only have one x-intercept, and that's negative 2. Okay. So for this one, I have to have a power of 4. There are three possible answers here. Because I'm going to get a plus 5 for one of my factors. I'm going to get an x minus 1 for one of my factors. And I'm going to get an x minus 8 for one of my factors. There's a problem, though. I'm supposed to have a polynomial of degree 4, right? Somebody's got to get squared. And that's why I said there's three possible answers here. I could put the square on the x plus 5. I could choose to put the square on the negative 1. Or I could choose to put the square on the negative 8, OK? Doesn't matter which one. It didn't specify or give me any other directions, so I can choose, OK? Now, had they told me specifically that 8 has a multiplicity of 2, then I would have to put the square on the 8, OK? But it didn't tell me, so I have a choice. Um, I didn't put it on anybody, <laughs> so I better put it on somebody real quick. Um, OK, so what is a possible degree of this function? How many turning points do I have? So if I add one, what degree could I have? It could be three cube. And then according to that in behavior, if it were a cube, would the leading coefficient be positive or negative? What kind of in behavior does this have? This has the same in behavior as a positive cube. How many turning points does this graph have? So then the degree should could be what? Two. And then two, according to the way the ends look, this guy going down and down, is the coefficient positive or negative? Negative. Now this one, how many turning points are in there? Three. So the degree could be what? What's one more? Four. Uh huh. You got it. And then what kind of coefficient? Going down. So negative. Good. <clears throat> How many turning points do we got there? So the degree. Yep. And then this one's a trickier one. What kind of coefficient does this guy have? Negative, because the regular odds are supposed to go up over here, right? And it's going down. So it has a negative coefficient. Oops. And that's it. So they're pretty much all the same like the stuff we've been doing. Just practice these. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those guys. We only did one. The very first practice problem we did, we did these. Okay. But you have five of them to just keep practicing that process with all the different kinds of functions, okay? I'm not gonna go into 3.5, I already ran out of time. Um, so we'll continue with 3.4 on Monday, but try to go in there before you forget everything. <laughs> try to go into 3.2 and try to knock out that homework assignment.